Greetings, everyone, and welcome back to the Yogic Studies podcast. This is episode 37. I'm your host, Seth Powell, and today we are joined by Professor Carl Ernst, who is the William R. Keenan Jr. Distinguished Professor of Religious Studies Emeritus, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Professor Ernst, a warm welcome to the Yogic Studies podcast. Thank you, Seth. It's really a pleasure to have you here. Um, I say this all the time, but I've really been hoping that you would do a course for us at Yogic Studies for, for mm -hmm. a long time. Um, I've, I've long been a, a fan of your work, having read your work on Sufism and yoga as an early grad student. It was very informative for um, some of my ideas about medieval India and especially North India. Um, mm -hmm and the interaction of yoga and other traditions like Sufism, which hopefully we'll uh, hear a lot about today and, uh, and in your upcoming course. Mm -hmm. But uh, first of all, I understand you've recently retired, uh, mm -hmm. at least from teaching. Um, so that's, we're all the more lucky to have you teach a course for us at Yogic Studies in your retirement. So, so congratulations on your retirement. Uh, how, how long did you teach for at, um, at Chapel Hill? 30 years at Chapel Hill, and before that, 11 years at Pomona College in California. Wow. And so how does it feel to, to be retired? Or what, what, what does retirement look, for, look like for you these days? Well, uh, I think I was a little bit apprehensive about it because when you're used to doing something for as long as I have been teaching, it's a pretty deeply ingrained habit. But I have discovered, and I was, I had a fantastic uh, retirement party that my colleagues threw for me last April. And uh, I was technically retired as of July. And one of the things I noticed was I was not going to meetings anymore. Mm -hmm. And that was good. I had a lot of administrative work in my time. I was director of the Center for Middle East and Islamic Studies at UNC for just about 20 years. And I had to do a lot of work with personnel issues, in the Department of Asian and Middle East Studies, I was on countless personnel promotion and review committees. And I spent a great deal of time coming up with plans for international studies in different ways. So that's all important work because it creates institutions and enables things to happen. But it's exhausting, to say the least. So what I did, am up to now, I have two books in press that are coming out this August, mm. which we might talk about, one of which is related to this subject of yoga, yogic studies, and the other one is very different. And I'm enjoying spending time with friends, with my family, and in the past year since I retired, or actually just since just before I retired, I spent a month lecturing in France, in Marseille, at the École des Hautes Études en Sciences Sociales, where I have some very good colleagues. And I was in Istanbul for a while with some groups that I work with, and that was really a lot of fun. I gave some talks in Tennessee at couple of institutions and most recently in January with my co-author from Duke University M. Bai Lo, we spoke at Stanford University in a major lecture and there's a lot of stuff going on with uh, the project which we wrote a book about which is coming out on Omar Ibn Sayyid, a West African Muslim scholar who was enslaved in North Carolina for over 50 years and who left 18 Arabic documents, which we have used as the basis of a wide-ranging book about Islam, Arabic, and slavery in America. Mm. Wow. That's a very 
timely and, and local project for you then. It is. It? And it's been enhanced by the performance of an opera about the life of this man. It's entitled Omar. And it was commissioned by Carolina Performing Arts at UNC and the Spoleto Festival in Charleston. Mm. It had its premiere last May. It has been performed in Los Angeles. And just a week and a half ago, it was in Chapel Hill. Mm. And it was a stupendous production. Sold out for two performances, 2,000 seats in the Memorial Hall. It's going to Boston after this. The uh, opera was written by Rhiannon Giddens, who is a very outstanding musician, Grammy winner, classically trained, specialist in roots music. The performance was quite moving and inspired. And I have a feeling that our book about Omar is going to gain a lot more attention as a result of this cultural event, which brings to the center of an important cultural performance someone who was very much on the margins. And we haven't had that kind of attention to people like Omar. I would add that my colleague and I discovered many things in our research. It had never been recognized previously that Omar in his Arabic documents was quoting Arabic Sufi poetry mm. and Islamic theological texts. And so we are presenting a, a, an analysis which is drastically different from what has been thought about him before. And in the course of this, we also examine the history of early Orientalism in America, the study of Arabic among missionaries and politicians, diplomats, and its deep connection to racism and many aspects of our national history that are deeply to be concerned about and which have to be rethought. Fantastic. Well, I'm glad you're having more time to devote to this important research. Now, before we get too much deeper into these subjects, and in particular to the topics of Sufism and mm -hmm. yoga, which will be the subject of your course, if you don't mind, maybe you can take us back a little bit. How did this all begin for you? How did you first get into the study of Islam, Sufism, and religion? How did you end up as a professor? Well, the way I explain this to myself is that my interest in international studies was stimulated by an experience that I had when I was very young. When I was 16 years old, I became a, an exchange student and I went to Chile, South America, and spent a year in a small town on the coast. And I went to school there and I became immersed in Spanish. And I found myself very unprepared for this experience. I knew very little about the rest of the world. And it seemed to me that this was kind of par for the course in America. Many people do not find it necessary to know very much about other countries. And you know, there's an old joke. What do you call a person who speaks one language? An American. This is a question. An American? Yes, well, that's right. Yeah. So uh, in any case, when I went to college at Stanford University, in the 60s, late 60s. It was kind of an exciting time to be a student in California. Mm. Lots of stuff happening. And so I ended up in the religious studies program there, which was part of a humanities honors program. And I found that, I thought that religion was a very important way to address this issue of intercultural understanding because it reaches so many deep dimensions of human experience. And so I took my first class on Islam at that point. And also I ended up doing a senior thesis on Mahayana Buddhism and Greek philosophy in a comparative mode. Mm. And then uh, after college, one of my close friends persuaded me that the best thing that we could focus our efforts on 
was learning Persian, <laughs> the language of Rumi and Hafez. And we did. And we started on our own, which you can do with Persian. It's not as difficult a language as Sanskrit or Arabic. And I realized that I would have to go someplace to make sense of this. And so I heard about Anna Marie Schimmel at, at Harvard, who was a great scholar of Sufism and Islamic culture. And so I went to study with her in 1975. And I found the experience of graduate school at Harvard was quite extraordinary. And I had great people to work with, including Wheeler Thaxon in Persian and Arabic, Bill Graham in Islamic studies, Schimmel, of course, Wilfred Cantwell Smith was, was there, mm. and others. I was the TA for John, Albert Lord in folklore, the great scholar of oral and epic poetry. He was teaching a class on 800, for 800 students. Wow. And I was there for his last lecture on the Odyssey. So I was exposed to lots of great things, and I wanted to do a dissertation on classical Sufism. I got a Fulbright and was accepted to go to Iran for the year. This turned out to be 1978, when they had a revolution. Wow. So uh, I remember getting a, a telegram, which actually still existed in those days, in which I was advised that conditions were not conducive for research at the shrine of Imam Reza in Mashhad. So we reconfigured the the grant and went to India and I spent most of the year in Aligarh. And I worked with a great scholar there named K.A. Nizami and he told me he wanted to introduce me to the full range of manuscript sources for the study of Sufism and Islam in South Asia. And that's when I got really absorbed in that particular cultural experience. There's nothing like manuscripts. Oftentimes the scribe will will sign uh, the, at the end of the work a personal note and ask the readers to say a prayer for him. And so you get kind of used to this very intensely personal dimension of the handwritten document. And I've looked back at my notes, which were kept in little, you know, notebooks that I bought in the bazaar from the different libraries that I visited around India that year. And I collected material, which I photographed myself and made my own microfilms of many manuscripts, which I continue to use to this day. Mm. And so it was at that time that I also learned Urdu and to go along with Persian and Arabic, which were my sort of mainstays. And so I had a postdoc with the American Institute of Indian Studies and then got a job at Pomona College in Claremont, which was uh, somewhat improbable. There was only, there were no jobs in Islamic studies the year I graduated from Harvard. What was, sorry to interrupt, but what, what was the topic of your dissertation? Ah, uh, well, it was about the ecstatic sayings of the Sufis. Mm. And there are certain works which collect these ecstatic sayings in which people talk about their experiences frequently approaching divinization. And I also was asking the question, what did it take to get yourself executed? And were, in fact, the Sufis being oppressed by the religious authorities or what was going on. And one of the main characters I talked about was Halaj, who was executed in Baghdad in 922 and is well known for his association with the phrase, I am the truth. Mm -hmm. One of the things I found in my dissertation research was that when you look at the story of Halaj and his execution, 
it's intensely political. And the religious scholars in the Islamic tradition do not have the authority to execute people. Kings do. And so Halaj fell afoul of a number of political currents during his day. But he was also the author of brilliant works, many of which were burned. But that was a, a subject which I kept thinking about for a long time. I published that book in 1985 as Words of Ecstasy in Sufism. And it was an opening of the subject. Much more could be said about it. But I became also interested in one of the commentators on Halaj, whose name is Ruz Bahan, a Sufi from Shiraz, who had an extraordinary gift in writing. His power of communication was extraordinary. And so I've had a long relationship with the Persian culture. And I ended up visiting Iran a number of times later years. And I've also had some recognitions from the Iranian academic authorities. My Some of my books have been much more widely read in Persian translation mm. than in English. So that was a big part of the experience. Uh, so I spent a year in Pakistan in 1986, which was also quite valuable. I had many wonderful contacts there. And it was quite something to spend both times in both India and Pakistan and see how they, in a way, are cut off from each other. And the repercussions of the partition continue to be felt. But I've had a lot of close relationships in those places. I eventually decided that I wanted to be involved with a PhD program in religious studies. And an opportunity came up in 1992, and I went to the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where I spent the bulk of my career. And I went there with the intention of building programs, and that happened. I worked very closely with colleagues who have become some of my very best friends, Bruce Lawrence and Duke. We taught courses together at least seven times. And we co-authored a book together, and we continued to work together. And as the first Islamic studies person in my department at UNC, I realized that a lot had to be done to develop the field there. So this meant that I ended up doing things like working with people to create new institutes, new positions, new programs, new majors. And I'm happy to say that a lot of that is still going forward. And I, I have some amazing colleagues who joined the Department of Religious Studies at UNC. There are three Islamicists in the department now, after my departure. And so the Middle East Center has grown. The South Asia program has grown, the languages program. So that was a very important part of my uh, professional life, developing those institutions and those resources which enable us to have languages and to have courses on foreign cultures. And so I've ended up, I describe my work is divided into three parts. First is general and critical issues in Islamic studies. I wrote a book called How to Read the Quran. I have a, a survey of Islam in the contemporary world. I edited a volume on Islamophobia and also one on rethinking Islamic studies. So these were kind of discipline specific to religious studies, but to trying to talk about what is Islamic studies and how should it be carried out? How does it relate to other subjects? The second area that I continue to pursue is Sufism, Islamic mysticism, 
and spirituality, both in its early history and in, up to the contemporary period, when many dramatic changes take place in the way that it is experienced. And so this took me to a number of places. I went to Turkey on a regular basis for many years and formed close relationships with people there. I had the opportunity to spend time in Iran only for short visits because of the political situation. Mm. But I have very cordial relations with scholars in Shiraz and Tehran in the Institutes of Philosophy and Religious Studies. And that's a, a very important connection for me. Then uh, the third area is what I call Indo-Muslim culture or Islam in South Asia. And this includes the study of yoga traditions, which we're interacting with Sufi ideas. Because it's kind of an interesting coincidence that when, at the time when the Sufis first arrived in India, which is probably the, about 1200 or so, was also a time when many new kinds of ascetics were to be found in India. And unlike the ritually more defined groups of Brahmins who had certain boundaries in terms of their social interactions, a jogi, and I use the Northern Indian pronunciation, a jogi could go to a Sufi hospice and just sit down for a meal with the Sufis and no problem. Mm. Yeah. And so I think a lot of interesting conversations must have taken place in those situations. I've also looked at the ways in which, for instance, Muslims created an imagination about architectural sites like the Ellora Caves. I have worked on a particular Persian text which describes the Ellora Caves as a, as a monument to a great king, which is very much like Persepolis in Iran. Hmm. And I've also looked at uh, a lot of other aspects of Islamic culture in South Asia, including poetry and and art. So one of the things I would say about Sufism is that this spiritual and ethical dimension of Muslim cultures is always defined in terms of location. There is no Sufism in general. Sufi orders and traditions are tied to lineages of masters and disciples that come from particular places and which are monumentalized in shrines that are oftentimes a focus of significant pilgrimages. And so for people in India, Ajmer in Rajasthan is one of the great centers for Sufi pilgrimage, the shrine of Moinuddin Chishti. And the music which goes on at these performances has also been a subject I've been very interested in and I've written mm -hmm. about. So uh, those are some of the things which, which I ended up doing. And a lot of my essays have been collected in a couple of volumes, one of which is called Refractions of Islam in India. And so that's where my South Asian material can be seen. And the last thing I'd say about my academic career is that I was very touched and pleased when colleagues and former students put together a volume of essays responding to my work. It's called Words of Experience, Translating Islam with Carl Ernst. And it was, it has an opening essay from my old friend, Bruce Lawrence, which is quite amusing. <laughs> And uh, the essays, which I, I agreed that this be performed if people would talk about the future of scholarship and not simply reflecting on the past. And I'm pleased that they actually do that. So that's kind of a brief overview of what I've been doing. And it's been fun. And, uh, and not, not nearly over yet. Well, thank you for that um, incredible um, journey. Um, 
it was it, it's great to just sort of ride on your coattails through um all of your your travels and learning um you've sort of touched on it in in several places in 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 that story but if i was just to ask you directly in in as simple terms as possible you know what is sufism and mm-hmm. and who are the sufis well this question is very old the term that they use in arabic is tasawwuf and arabic has an interesting grammatical form which is about belonging to a group or joining a group so for instance if you wanted to become french the word for french in arabic the word for france is faransa so to become french is tafarnasa and the word for christian is nasrani if you want to become a christian it's tanasara mm. so there's something called a sufi and if you want to become one it's tasawuf it's a process of becoming a Sufi. And so we translate this as Sufism, but that has an ism on the end. It's an English word. And it belongs to the list of ideologies, which are distinguished as isms, as Europeans tried to divide up the world into bite-sized chunks in the Enlightenment. So Sufism is not the same as Tasawwuf, because Tasawwuf means to become a Sufi. Hmm. Whereas Sufism suggests an ideology, institutions, etc., so when people use this word to so often early texts, they'd say, what is it? And you would get an answer like this. To so often means to prefer others to yourself. Now, you probably haven't, can't think of very many good examples of people who have demonstrated that quality. But you can imagine it. And so what that little answer has done is to create a teaching it was an ideal that could be formed in, in your consciousness. And it's an ethical teaching. It didn't really take separate form. It is something which we associate, historically speaking, with Islamic traditions. Because when it was introduced, it was always in terms of teachings associated with the Prophet Muhammad and the Quran. And sometimes people use it as if it's a generic form of mysticism, which could be found anywhere. But I prefer to use it historically. And so it is a tendency to focus on the ethical and spiritual dimensions of life. But with reference to vocabularies and experiences which arose in Muslim societies. It probably doesn't become an independent movement for a couple of centuries after the Prophet Muhammad, who died in 632. But by around 900 in the Persian frontier of Central Asia and in the central regions of around Baghdad, there were groups of people, many of whom came from the artisan class, who began to share experiences and talk about consciousness to try to construct an inward dimension of experience. And they developed a vocabulary which drew heavily on the Quran to describe this inner realm of experience. Eventually, by around the 12th century, this began to become more public. The earliest phase was fairly private. In fact, Sufis were secretive and did not believe that it was good to throw pearls before swine, to use a New Testament metaphor. So when some of the Sufi writers who are developing their writing in the 10th century begin to develop a technical vocabulary, this is very self-conscious and deliberate. And a technical terminology has two functions. One is to facilitate communication between people who share a particular concern. The other function is to exclude outsiders. So people like Halaj, whom I mentioned, and other thinkers in Baghdad, like Junaid and others, developed a vocabulary for talking about ethics, for talking about the qualities of the soul and how they connect to the divine and angelic realms. 
So this was also about the annihilation of the ego. And this results in some interesting paradoxes. If the saint is someone who has annihilated his ego, does he know he is a saint? And so you end up with people saying, the Sufi does not say that he is a Sufi. So this is kind of defying the external definitions which we use in scholarship. Eventually, this becomes a very popular subject, in part because of the identification of the Sufi saint as an intermediary between humans and the divine. And the formation of lineages was very important for this because the Sufi master and disciple relationship was reconstructed to go all the way back to the Prophet Muhammad. And every lineage has its meaning only because of that. Sometimes this happens in trans historical ways. For instance, in North Africa, the very widespread Tijani Sufi order arose shortly after 1800 when the founder of the order was in Mecca and he had a series of visions of the Prophet Muhammad who told him to start a new Sufi order with his direct authorization. Hmm. So that's oh, another challenge to historical understanding. But uh, what's interesting about Sufism is that it became so popular and so widespread that kings everywhere found it to be very desirable to support the Sufi orders and to make donations to the shrines and build fabulous structures there. So you find in Samarkand, for instance, in the Indian Deccan, in Old Cairo, in Istanbul, these vast networks of shrines. And they're often very similar because you have an attached mosque. So there's and and funerary monuments and Islamic custom are always oriented towards Mecca. In other words, the the grave is laid so that the person who is is the body is placed on the right side, facing Mecca. And so there's a an Islamic orientation built into the shrine. And these institutions became so powerful that probably it was inevitable, but in the 18th century, certain resistance and critique arose in a powerful way, as we can see in the Wahhabi movement in Arabia, in which they regarded Sufi shrines as idolatrous worship of human beings. And so the Wahhabis, for instance, made a good effort to destroy every tomb in the Arabian Peninsula. And they succeeded in destroying the tomb of Ali, for instance, several times. And people may not be aware of this, but in Jeddah, near the Red Sea, there is the tomb of Eve, hmm. who uh, descended from heaven at the same time as Adam, but he landed in India, in Sri Lanka. Hmm. So, uh, anyway, in modern times, Sufism has become a contested subject in Muslim societies. Mm-hmm. Sufi orders were abolished in Turkey in 1925 by the secular regime of Ataturk. They had been pretty much stamped out in Arabia because of the Wahhabi perspective. And in Iran, they had been severely suppressed because of the authoritarian trends of the current regime. Are those more, moder- fact, are those more modern trends, though? Would yes, you, although... H- historically, have these Sufi orders existed more harmoniously with so-called more orthodox Islamic institutions? They were the orthodox. If you were in Mecca in 1750, all of the juristic schools were under the control of Sufis. Mm. And it is only in modern times that these new ideologies have arisen, which we call fundamentalists. And one of the things about fundamentalism is what they would like to assert is that they are restoring the original teachings. And if you believe in time machines, there's a large bridge in New York that I'd like to sell you for a very reasonable price. Uh, There are no time machines. And you can't go back and recreate the, I mean, if, if evangelical fundamentalists say that they're 
re returning to the original Christianity of the disciples of Jesus, that's impossible. And they ignore the fact that we've had such things as the Protestant Reformation as a major overturning of previous traditions. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the rise of new ideologies in Muslim societies has created the illusion that there was no such thing as Sufism in the past. But it was a major characteristic in countries from Morocco to Central Asia and Southeast Asia. But that's all changing now because the rise of nationalism and the end of feudalistic regimes has reconfigured religion under the control of the state in a way which never was imagined in previous times. So Sufism is something that the state likes to control because anything that concerns large numbers of people is of interest to the state. And in Malaysia, you can't publish a book on religion without permission from the sultanates. And in Iran, you can't publish a book on without permission of the Ministry of Culture. Mm. And well, it goes on and on. So Sufism is a contested subject. It gets reconfigured in ways which are sometimes taking on new age vocabulary, sometimes drawing upon, I mean, for instance, when they were starting to loosen up in Central Asia in the former Soviet Russia, there was a film produced by the Chamber of Commerce of Bukhara about the great Sufis of Central Asia. And they didn't really know anything about Sufism anymore because the Soviet regime was so effective in erasing knowledge of religion. So they said, well, Bahaudin Naqshband was such a great man as a Sufi that he was almost like Tol Tolstoy or Gandhi. And so they would use these modern political references to establish that. So but, if, if, if we look at India in particular, historically, yeah. well, what, is, what is unique or, or, or distinct about Sufism, these Sufi orders, and, and the way that Sufism developed in India compared mm -hmm. to you know, some of these other places in Iran or Baghdad or, or, or elsewhere? Well, the, uh, again, the local element is very important. And so the locality is defined by the shrine, by the lineage, and by the language. So Sufi orders very early began to be Indian in a number of important respects. I was able to discover, for instance, in documents that I found in the Deccan, which were originally recorded in the 14th century, that the Chistis, who came from Delhi down to the Deccan continued to use among themselves a form of old Punjabi. And they would compose poetry in it. So Baba Farid Gandeshakar, who's buried in Pakistan, is credited with a number of verses in old Punjabi. And I was able to find in one of my texts a verse of his, which is in the Guru Granth Sahib of the, of the Sikhs. Mm. And this has always been claimed by the Sikhs, but European scholars cast doubt upon this because they thought they should show off their critical skills and show that things were not what they appeared to be. But it was confirmed by Christopher Shackle, great scholar of Punjabi, so as that we had lines from Baba Farid in the, in the Guru Granth Sahib that were in the Sufi text, which, which I had found in, in Khuldabad. And so it's also therefore important to notice that Sufi writers were some of the main contributors to the development of vernacular literatures in Northern and Western India and in Bengali as well. And this was at a time when those languages did not have much prestige in the Brahmin circles where Sanskrit was the standard. And so there's a whole series of romances in Eastern Hindi, for instance, Eastern Awadhi, 
mm-hmm. by Sufi writers, which they call the primakyans. Right. And these frequently are filled with all kinds of Indic themes and metaphors and so forth. And, and the fact that they the fact that they didn't compose those in Persian or Arabic is significant, right? Yeah, and sometimes there's a kind of an obligatory apology. <laughs> okay. You know, so for instance, in Bengali, you have the Nabi of Amsha, which has recently been translated into English for the first time. And at the beginning, he says, well, I really apologize for using this local language, but mm-hmm. I should have been doing this in Arabic or Persian. And, but this is a formal thing. They did this because it was their own language. They loved it. Yeah, yeah. There's just a form of humility of kind of, yeah. you know, honoring the, the classical, right. I guess. And music is also something which takes on a very local color. Yeah. So these were ways in which Sufism became Indian. And so we also have, and we'll talk about this more, uh, engagements with Indian thought in a more literary and philosophical level, including yoga. So... This means that um, there's just a a very strong, interesting cultural dimension of of Indian location that is characteristic of Sufism. And in modern times, this becomes controversial because fundamentalists wanted to present Islam as something that was not connected to culture, which sounds crazy, but there it is. And so this meant that in reform movements in the 19th and 20th centuries, there was an effort to get rid of Indian elements or things that might be considered Indic. For instance, in one of the fatwa collections of the Deoband school, which derives from people who were all Sufis from the Chishti order, they decided to get rid of a lot of customary practices like pilgrimage, music, shrine, uh, amulets, and things like that. And so one of these fatwas says, we do not deny that spiritual grace emanates from the shrines of great saints. But it looks too much like what the Hindus are doing if you go to pilgrimage at these places. Mm-hmm. So it was sort of a strange way of criticizing that practice but that's one of the ways in which it becomes contested yeah yeah we like to draw these neat lines and boundaries and tell ourselves that islam is over here and hinduism is over here but the sufis Mm -hmm. i think are, are a great study for the ways in which these boundaries are constructed and and change and you can go to a darga a tomb of a of a sufi saint in in new delhi and there'll be Hindus, Muslims. You don't know where the Hindus <laughs> end and the and the and the Muslims begin. Perhaps um, there's there's a lot going on in 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 a scene like that with Kowali music. With um, yeah, if you were just an alien who just landed there and you're just observing these things for the first time, you might not think that these were people from different traditions, but local people who are participating in some sort of gathering and, and, you know, singing and chanting. Uh, how, so, yeah. so how does the kind of Sufi encounter in India like that, how does it um, nuance our understanding of religious identity in these categories? Well, um, I think there's something to be, to be learned from seeing how it's deployed in different countries, because the politicization of religious identity has been very strong and nationalistic in the last 150 years. So Islam has been, in Pakistan, is associated with the state. And so there, they typically will publicly talk about the Sufis as the transmitters of Islam. And they will downplay elements of local culture to a certain extent, although there are certainly a lot of people who love Buley Shah and the great Punjabi poets and so forth, and who admire them for their lack of of uh, 
arrogance and and so forth. But in India, officially speaking, Islam is not exactly popular among government circles. And so to a certain extent, Sufism is considered to be acceptable to the degree in which it's not Islamic. Hmm. But those are trade-offs in both directions. So everybody likes to be involved with Sufi music. And that's kind of a brand which is very popular. Yeah. You know, if you follow Coke Studios, sure. There are some songs on there which have like 200 million views. Now, Seth, I want to tell you something. You and I will never have 200 million views. What? I thought this video was going to go viral. <laughs> Unless maybe you're singing some things that I haven't heard before. <laughs> but uh, there is something going on there which is quite amazing. Quite amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the degree to which Bollywood and pop culture have seized yeah. upon the spirit of Sufi music, um, we, probably, you know, we can't underestimate the impact of that. Indian culture. Yeah, but like everything else, it's been transformed by recent cultural changes because it used to be that Sufi music was something that was found in shrines. You had to have permission. People would frequently perform ablutions as if for prayer. Mm -hmm. It was a very highly regulated cultural experience, spiritual experience. But when you it was performed in a concert hall, maybe by the same musicians, All of a sudden, the musician who was at the shrine, a service person in order who was there to help an elite group have spiritual experiences, now the musician is becoming a star. And with recorded music, and remember, you know, it's not been more than 150 years, let's say, since recorded music became available. Before 1900, all music was live. You had to be in the presence of the musician. Now we all have our iPhones and what have you. Mm -hmm. And so mass production of music means that the musician is a star. And that really changed things. Sure. I've looked at a lot of the manuals of discipline which talk about how you listen to music. Mm. And by the way, the Sufis don't talk about music. They talk about listening. Mm. It's not about the production of sound. It's about the perception of inner resonances. Interesting. Well, let's let's shift gears a little bit from Coke Studio and Kuali Music to to yoga. So tell us, you know, this is you you mentioned this is sort of a third branch of your scholarship. Um, it's certainly been. Um, I mean, I mean, it's a it's a fascinating and I still think understudied. Uh, topic of looking at um, the Islamic and Sufi um, interaction with yoga and yogis in India, and in particular the texts that were produced uh, through this mm -hmm. intercultural exchange, if you will. Uh, so tell us a little bit about um, your work in this area, and maybe um, maybe we can focus in particular on the the Bahar al Hayat. Um, no. as one of these remarkable texts in this story. Um, listeners may be familiar with this text because maybe they've seen some of those images online or as a part of the um, that Smithsonian art exhibit. Uh, mm -hmm. Was it Yoga and the Art of Transformation, I think it was yes. called, that yes. Deborah Diamond curated uh, in yes. 2013, I believe. Um, and in, in that exhibit, you have a wonderful essay that you provided, uh, you gave a series of talks, I believe. But we see those uh, the illustrated manuscript of the Bar al Hayat, and I think it has 20 or 21 yogic postures or asanas um, with really beautiful um, illustrations, which is quite uh, unique. Um, mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about maybe that text and then and then kind of just broader as well about you know this this engagement of sufis and yogis well that's right and that's going to be that text will be a focus of the the course that i'll be speaking in 
So I first became interested in this question because of a lot of the older literature on Sufism, which was written in a spirit of Orientalist condescension. And the early work on Sufism that was produced by European scholars, we can go back to Sir William Jones, 1789, he's in India. He has an essay called The Mystical Poetry of the Persians and the Hindus. Now, what's kind of interesting about that title of his essay is that to their mind, to the minds of these British scholars who were finding themselves in control of this territory in India, Asia was all the same. Asia was everything that was not Europe. And so to speak of the Persians and the Hindus is more or less the same thing. Mm -hmm. And also they had uh, some definite views about Islam. Islam was bad. It was antithetical to Christianity, therefore it was bad. It was supposedly violent, and it was bad. And it was supposedly mean to women, because it, and that was bad. And God forbid that there be any consideration of violence or anti-women thought in, in Europe. But uh, if Sufism was there, and they found it to be interesting, because Sir William Jones translated some poetry by Hafiz, and, and the... The British who became, they had to learn Persian because that was a language of administration in India. So Sufism was interesting. It was They thought it was cool because it's about beauty, it's about love, it's about wine. Can't have anything to do with Islam. So where does it come from? Maybe the New Testament, maybe Greek philosophy, but probably India. So there's a lot of literature that was written which says the Sufism only exists because of India. And it doesn't really, it's not really Islamic. And so that's when you get people saying that there's an Orthodox Islam and then there's the Sufi and they're completely apart. And that is a serious misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. But it led me to think, how would one actually test this hypothesis, if it is a hypothesis, and not just a prejudice. So I thought, well, it would be interesting to look at some cases where we actually have some documents that indicate that Muslims were looking at Indian sources and thinking about them. And what's ludicrous is that um, these arguments about influence and borrowing, and these are very mechanical terms, Influence, by the way, is an astrological term for the influence of a planet upon you. And so it takes away any sense of agency. It's not about how you interpret something. It's sort of like I opened a door and I became under the influence of India. And then I had no, I couldn't help myself. Mm. That's a kind of ridiculous way to understand cultural change. But I discovered that there were some texts which were about this in which Muslim authors had written about yoga in Arabic and other languages. And so what was actually going on in those texts? That's what we're going to be talking about in my class. So the preface, the prelude to the Bahr Hayat, which you mentioned, which was written in 1551 by Muhammad Gauss, is an uh, earlier work in Arabic, which was called, in Arabic, it was called the Mirat al-Ma'ani, which means the mirror of meanings. But it said that it was a translation of a Sanskrit work called the Amrita Kunda, the pool of nectar. Right. We actually cannot locate that text. There is no indication that it ever existed separately, but it, it probably is drawing upon uh, several different texts, uh, which we can identify. <clears throat> anyway, but if you look at the this Arabic Amrita Kunda, a third of it has nothing to do with India. It has a preface which includes 
an allegory from a Persian philosopher and a version of the New Testament apoc apocryphal story of the hymn of the pearl from the Gnostic Acts of Thomas. And this is presented as an introduction to this Indian material. And then the third and 10th chapters have nothing to do with India. And so you have somebody weaving in stuff along with accounts of yoga postures, mantras, chakras, and yogini goddesses hmm. who are not identified as goddesses, but are called spiritual beings. And so there's a sense in which it, you can throw some additional material from Islamic philosophy and other kinds of spiritual literature. And that's perfectly good to explain the Indian material. So there's a, a hermeneutic or an interpretive method going on, which is not simply taking the Indian teaching as an autonomous subject, but it's domiciling it and naturalizing it and representing it in a package that will be understandable by readers of Persian and Arabic. Mm -hmm. So, but the Orientalists were so absurd about this. Uh, see, Muhammad Gauss, the, the one who did the next phase, he produced the Battle Hayat, which is four times as long mm. as the Arabic text, which it pretends to be a translation of. He threw in more than the kitchen sink. He threw in the refrigerator. Mm -hmm. He threw in the water heater. <laughs> Full renovation project. And so, uh, but it's funny because he was also renowned for his other teachings. And he has a very important work he wrote in Persian called The Five Jewels, which is a collection of meditative techniques. And it relies heavily on the uh, incantations, which have Arabic formulas and which are powerful prayers to produce results. In an encyclopedia produced by a missionary named Hughes in 1881, that book, The Five Jewels, is described as basically a totally Hindu teaching. I can only find two short passages which refer to Indian things in this book. Everything else is Arabic prayers. Mm. This strikes me as a ridiculous kind of all or nothing notion of cultural transmission. Mm -hmm. Sufism must be from India, so everything the Sufis do must be Indian. So, but let's get to the Battle Hayat. It was not the first version of the Arabic pool of nectar. There are at least three or four other translations that were made into Persian by anonymous figures. Hmm. And I think that Muhammad Gauss basically took one of them and then he developed from there and added a lot of stuff of his own. But just to give you an example of how he expands the text, in the Arabic pool of nectar, chapter four is on the postures, the asanas. It gives you five. Hmm. In Muhammad Gauss, in his version, he gives you 22. And he gives you the name. And descriptions of them as well. Yeah, but he gives you the Hindi name. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't there in the in the Arabic version. Mm, interesting. And so, in addition, uh, in the ninth chapter, which is in the Arabic, is the Yogini goddesses, clearly. It includes names of Yoginis who are well known from the 12th century Yogini cult. It was widespread in northern India. Muhammad Gauss drops all that material and replaces it with a series of meditations from the Shatari order where he was a master. And these are astounding. They're amazing. But they have nothing to do with India. Sure. And then the 10th chapter, which is the last chapter, in the Arabic, Amir Tukunda, it it didn't have any identifiable Indian material. It was more or less a summary of ascetic practices and it had the conclusion of the story of the Hymn of the Pearl, which is about the descent of the soul into matter and it has much more to do with the Manichaean 
texts of the early Christian era. Mm. But Muhammad Gallus replaced the 10th chapter with three, or you know, actually four creation stories, which he introduces by talking about the, the notion of the uh, alak, which in Sanskrit is alakshan, the traceless, and the niranjan, another term for the transcendental existence. And then he tells you these four creation stories, one of which is kind of a Sufi story about how there was a call and an echo. And from that call and the echo, all the world was created. It uses primarily Persian and Arabic terms, and it's it's a charming little account. He then gives you a very strongly indexed story about the uh, the turning of the ocean with the the whole mythology of of that, and he ends up with a goddess. The goddess has come back. He kicked the goddesses out in the ninth chapter, but in the tenth chapter she's back, hmm. and it's a kind of non uh, conventional Puranic story about the goddess. Have some blisters appear on her hands, which turn into rubies, out of which emerge Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. And I found versions of this story in some rather peripheral places in India, in Nepal, in on the coast of Tamil Nadu, and in central India. It's it's non-Brahmanic. It's it's a kind of marginal tradition, because the goddess is superior to these to Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. And there's versions of these stories which are quite raucous. Hmm. But uh, she ends up creating the world. And then there's a fourth story, which is, again, Middle Eastern. And it calls upon a mythology relating to the Wakwak tree, which is a tree described in traveler stories, the Sinbad stories, on which women and animals grow like fruit. And so at the end, he concludes by saying, but where, after all, does a human form come from? And he ends with a question. And that's so extraordinary. It's as if all these different creation stories are equally good and equally fun, but nothing is the final word on the subject. But those are just a couple of examples of how he explains the, uh, how, how he ex expands this tradition. So there's, and so, then, there's so much the, going, there's so much going on in a text like that. And I'm, I'm, I'm wondering as you're, as you're speaking, who the audience for such a text is. And I, and I believe if I'm not mistaken, isn't there, there's a belief that the patron, at least, or who commissioned that text, was it the Mughal emperor, Jahangir? Well, the copy that we have with the oldest illustrations is from, we believe it's from, commissioned by Jahangir, who was hanging out in Allahabad in 1603 to 1604, waiting for his father, Akbar, to die. During that time, he commissioned about at least four manuscripts with strong Indic content. That had great illustrations. Was the Vasishta Sangita one of them? The Yoga Vasishta was one of them. Yoga Vasishta, yeah. And there, there's another. There's a couple of others which have not been adequately studied. But and there's three other copies that are illustrated. One in Hyderabad. One that used to be in the collection of Simon Digby, which is now in Cambridge. The oldest one is in the Chester Beatty Library in Dublin. You're saying Bar, Bar al Hayat, there's three different illustrated manuscripts of, the, of there's that. There's four. four. And there's another one which is in Chapel Hill. Because once when I was in London for a conference in the early 90s, I got a call from Simon Digby. If you're not familiar with Digby, he was yeah. an unbelievable scholar. Incredible. And he called me up and he said, Carl, I need you to go down to the Sam Fogg book dealer and take a look at the manuscript because they have a copy of an illustrated copy of the Battle Hayat. And I'm afraid it could be the Hyderabad copy stolen. Mm. 
He said, you're the only one I know who's seen the Hyderabad copy. Could you go down and check it out? You had seen this during your your. I had travels. seen the Hyderabad copy. Yeah. I was trying, trying to get a, a, a microfilm of it. And the closest I ever came to getting in a fight with a librarian physically mm -hmm. was when they refused to make a microfilm for me for that. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I went to the Sam Fogg book dealer and I looked at the manuscript. It was not the Hyderabad copy. Mm. It was older and better. Mm. And so I said, this is now something that you can sell, but I want you to wait for a while until I get back to Chapel Hill and talk to the librarians there. And so we got it and it's now available to be seen there. And it's it's really a fine manuscript. Which is but which all, is the one that the was four. published that was published in the Smithsonian exhibit. Was that No, that um, was the Chester Beatty. Chester that was the older one. That was from sixteen oh three. The Chapel Hill one is seventeen ten. But all the illustrated copies have the identical program. The illustrations are basically the same. Okay. And there's also one folio missing from the Chester Beatty Library. No one had discovered this before. And one picture is obviously missing. But we still have 21 illustrations because there's one illustration which is in chapter two, which is about the practice of meditating with your eyes crossed. And that's not from the series of 22 postures in chapter two. Yeah, if you don't mind, maybe actually I had it pulled up here. Maybe I can share my screen and we yes. can just look at a few of these just so that if people are watching this on YouTube. Sorry, if you're, yeah. if you're just listening to this, you won't see this. But if you're watching this, can you see that, Carl? There we go. Yeah. Okay. So, so what are we looking at here? Well... These are two of the pictures here. And as you can see, they're kind of delicate miniature paintings. And there is a text in front of, uh, on top of each one of these. So uh, that's in Arabic, right? It's a, a Persian. This is Persian. Oh, excuse me. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. And, uh, you, yeah, just to clarify. So you're saying, so this is the, this is the Persian text that claims to be a translation of of an Arabic text, yeah. which claims to be a translation of a Sanskrit text called the Amrita Kunda. Right. Pool of Nectar. Yeah. And so uh, these are, this is actually more of a coffee table book than a practical manual. I would not advise people to try these postures at home. But they are arguably more or less in correspondence with the description of the posture in the text. And I have a, translated that text in an early draft, which is available on the Smithsonian website, the fourth chapter with the description of the, the postures. I've improved the translation considerably, but I have not yet published that version. What's quite interesting to me as well is that some of these yogis have some of the accoutrements of the not yogis they have this That's horn right. necklace the singhi you know they've got big hooped earrings um i think this right. one has the dog sitting by his yes. wayside yes. um they're not all necessarily depicted in that way but a number of them seem specifically that they are not yogis i think that these were probably made in the basis of live models and there's probably art historians have distinguished four different painters in this manuscript by brush strokes and technique. Mm. And so, yes, these are clearly associated with the not yogis. And that makes sense because their main figures are named in the text. There's a section on the importance of breath control in which we are See, given the names of Goraknath, Machindranath, and mm -hmm. a third one, who is that? I've forgotten at the moment. But that text, that tradition is clearly referred to. And also they are referred to as Siddha yogis. Sure. But 
there is still some work to be done on trying to determine the exact affiliation here. Jason Birch has been working on a number of texts, and you may be familiar with this, but he has come across evidence that in the Dalu Ponthi tradition, which is coming from Western India, there is a text which has almost the identical postures with exactly the same names. But there is some question, it's probably coming from another source which is common to both of them because there are enough differences and also the date doesn't work very well because his text is a little later than the Battle Hayat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it could have been an earlier source. Right. So, uh, yeah, well, they're, they're wonder, people... wonderful paintings and um, reading the text alongside the painting, when you have an yeah. illustration of a posture, it can it can add quite a lot to what are sometimes very terse descriptions. Yes, his are more poetic and expansive than mm -hmm. the typical yoga text because he's also trying to explain this for an audience who is less familiar with them. Yeah. Well, I'm sure we'll explore that more in the course, but that's a nice little preview um, for folks. Um, as we start to kind of wind down here, um, what are what are just some other things that you might share with us that kind of the Sufis do mm -hmm. as they integrate yoga into their own vernacular, their own language and tradition? You you talked about mm -hmm. some of the things that the author of the Bar Al Hayat does but um are, are there other examples that come to mind of sort of sufi interpretations of sort of things from from hatha yoga well uh and i think we can also step back for just a second and talk about there's on the one hand yoga in the more philosophical tradition right going back to patanjali which has some aspects of physical practices but a lot of it is more abstract and philosophical but i don't think that most of the muslim authors who we will encounter had a concept of yoga as such in other words uh we are very familiar with the term yoga it's used all the time but when Al-Biruni did his Arabic version of the Patanjali text, he doesn't, he doesn't use the word yoga from Sanskrit. And so basically he, like other writers, was assimilating it to Arabic vocabulary for asceticism, for... Uh, what does he call He calls it the, is it the Kitab... Al Patanjali or something? The book yeah, that of, means the book of Patanjali. Book of Patanjali. And it's also known as the book of uh, release from sorrow or from suffering. But it doesn't say the book of yoga. Right. I That's not in the title. That. Hmm. It's called the book of release from suffering. And in the page, in the first page of the text, he says, I'm going to talk about this and how it compares with the doctrines of Christians, Greek philosophers, and Sufis. And you have to remember, and I, I will say more about this in the talks, the Muslim intellectuals of the High Caliphate did not regard the Indian civilization as an autonomous culture that they would have to understand on its terms. Al-Biruni and others firmly were convinced that Pythagoras had taught the Indians the fundamentals of philosophy and knowledge and religious practice. <laughs> uh -huh. And so all this had to be put under the categories of Greco-Arabic thought. So when the Sufis become interested in this subject, they are not looking at Patanjali, they're not looking at 
texts of yoga, they are interested in certain practices. And so mantra, chakra, and asana are probably the terms that would describe for most people what they were interested in. But they don't use those terms. They don't use in Sanskrit terms. They use Persian terms. And breath is something that comes up a lot, but it's generally not pranayama. But there is holding the breath is discussed quite a lot. But there's also a tradition which Sufis credibly connect to Iran, where they have a sense of practices of breath control among early Sufis that do not owe anything to India. And one of the ways you can tell is that they have a different enumeration of how many breaths there are in one day. And also, more frequently, they're not talking about breath, holding the breath, but they talk about uh, breath as divination. And so this is svara mm -hmm. in Sanskrit. It's not pranayama. And then Sufis were familiar with occult practices, including the subjugation of spirits. And that looks pretty much like what happens when you say a mantra to a yogini and cause her to appear. So they had frameworks which they could place the yoga material in. And Mohammed Raus is actually quite explicit about this. He says, they have some great experiences, the, the yogis. But he says, they don't have the theory. Mm. We have the theory. Mm. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. Well, uh, as, we, as we wind down here, um, the online course uh, that you're going to be offering, titled Sufism and Yoga, um, will run from April 7th through May 5th, 2023, mm -hmm. live. Um, if you're watching this in the future, it's already aired. You can still join us as everything's been recorded. Mm -hmm. um, but for those who are, who are thinking about joining, maybe just say a, a few words about um, what you've put together for the course and um, what, what students can expect and, and what you hope that students will get out of taking this course. Well... As I mentioned, one of the things I want to do is to move away from this kind of all or, no, all or nothing concept of relations between cultures. And I want to do that by discussing particular individual trajectories. Because Sufism is, and is not something which exists up here as a kind of an ideal form. There's lots of stories about different ways people have been involved with this. And I've emphasized the way in which different cultures can affect that. So um, I'm going to, the central part of the course will be the two lectures, number two and three, where I'm going to talk about three individual characters that I call the magician, the philosopher, and the master of incantations. The magician is the anonymous author of an early version of these teachings, which focuses on divination by breath and summoning yogini spirits with mantras. He's got a few chakras in there too. But he's not interested in doctrines. He wants to know powerful words that he can use. And he assimilates them to the model of the Sufi zikr performance. Mm. The second person is the, the philosopher. He's the one who put together the Arabic Amritakunda. And I have reason to think that he's probably trained in Iran in the philosophy of of the day. And he does a marvelous job of integrating this material into Near Eastern categories. But there's one passage I will discuss where he talks about his encounter with a yoga teacher, a, a yogi, in terms that are emotionally very powerful and it carries a strong auth authenticity. And so we'll, we'll take a look at that. And then the third character is the master of incantations, that's Mohammed Raus. And so that will be the center of the of the discussion, is to introduce those texts. And I've translated them all. And so I have a 
pretty clear feeling about how they should be presented. The first and fourth lectures, the first one will be introductory. We're talking about basic concepts of Sufism and yoga and about the early history of encounters between Muslim intellectuals in India, including an important embassy from the courts of the caliphs to India about the year 800, mm. which produced a report on the Indian religions, which is extremely interesting. And then there was a lot of fabulous stories about the marvels of India and the crazy things that you can find there, which is part of the cultural experience as well. And then the last lecture, was, I'm going to take some material that from the late Mughal period, which instead of calling it Islamic or Islamicate, can better be described as Persianate, because Islam, for some of these authors, is not really a dominant factor at all. Mm. This is true of Akbar's minister, Abul Fazl, who deliberately wanted to make the empire not based on Islam in any way, and who accepted the autonomy of Indian culture as a separate tradition. And it also includes Zoroastrian authors and Hindu authors writing in Persian, who use the categories of Sufism to describe yoga traditions and aesthetics. And then we'll move into more modern times with uh, some discussion of the Islamization of yoga, yoga practices among Turkish and Arab circles. And then yoga today as a popular practice in Middle Eastern and other countries, much like, as it is in America. Fantastic. Well, sounds like a tour de force and um thank you so much you know professor ernst for your for your time today sharing with us your your vast knowledge of of these subjects that we've just sort of scratched the surface on here in this podcast um but that students will have um access to uh through the course and um through the through the readings and translations um that we'll be providing so thank you so much uh, for your time and uh, for your scholarship and sharing uh, this with us. It's a wonderful opportunity to, to dive deep uh, into these topics. Well, thank you very much. I've appreciated the opportunity and I look forward to the course. All right, wonderful. Well, thanks everybody for tuning in. Thanks again to Professor Ernst. And uh, until next time, everyone, please take care. <laughs>